um, for those of you who join us um, for the first time or haven't listened to the previous episode preceding this one, we're here with Anna and Susanna um, who work at the Competence Center for Digital Law in Switzerland and have developed a DM Law tool. And in the previous episode, which I highly recommend for you to listen to, we talked about data protection, protection of personal data in your personal settings as well as in a research context. And now we continue our conversation to look um, into copyright, what it is, what it means, um, what are national and international specifics. Um, so yeah, welcome again, Susanna and Anna. And Thank you, Joe. Um, so yeah, let's dive right Thank in. You. What is copyright? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, certain general um, details. First of all, what does the, uh, copyright protect? It protects uh, literal and artistic works when three conditions are fulfilled. It has to be an intellectual creation. It means only what is created by uh, a person can be protected by copyright. So for example, um, a machine content nowadays is not protected by copyright. We don't recognize copyright protection to what is created by a machine if there is no uh, active behavior behind the machine made by a person. Um, a second condition is that uh, the, the, the work must be perceptible by senses. It means uh, we need, if we can read a text, uh, watch a movie, see an image, listen to music that can be protected by copyright, whereas an idea or the concept itself uh, behind the text, for example, is not protected by copyright. So only what is only the, the, the form of expression that the person gives to a certain idea is protected by copyright, um, not the idea itself. The third condition that must be fulfilled is uh, originality, uh, also sometimes called uh, individuality, the character of individuality. And that's the tricky condition because it, it has to be evaluated again on a case by case basis. Um, because every time you are wondering if you are dealing with a work protected by copyright, you need to uh, wonder, is, it, is this work, is this form of, form of expression original enough to be protected by copyright because if it's not if it's not original enough if for example a video is not original enough i just film while i walk without paying attention of uh, lights or of a specific position or whatever uh, there is no originality there is no personal contribution given by the author then this video is not protected by copyright and that means that anyone is allowed to use the video. I'm not, I, I cannot claim copyright protection for this video. These con three conditions are required mm, internationally by all copyright laws of the world. We have, there is um, an international act which is called the Berne Convention, which is signed by almost all countries of the world. And the, the, the goal of this Bern Convention is to harmonize, 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 given a harmonization of all copyright rules of different countries, because in the digital world, there, are, there is no border anymore. We, we share contents with so many countries. So many countries are involved in um, sharing contents. So it was needed to have one only international act that would apply to almost all cases. So the Berne Convention um, foresees that these three conditions must, must be fulfilled for a work to be protected by copyright. Then there are certain specific differences that can be um, set by national laws. For example, here in Switzerland, uh, our Swiss law, as well as German law, I know, uh, they grant copyright protection to photos lacking of originality. So a photo made by a person um, is protected by copyright, even if it is not original. That's often the case of uh, photos 
historically important. So press photos that are uh, done by many photographers uh, from different medias, for, from different press um, houses, and they have a historical value because they are capturing an important moment, even they, if they are not original because the photographer is not um, is not capturing a particular position or particular light, all photographers, maybe they are doing the same kind of photo. So there is a, protect, a copyright protection also in that case. Uh, that is an example to tell, uh, so to show that there may be different rules that apply in certain cases based on the country involved in a case. Um, so, when the author creates a work protected by copyright, first of all, the author is also the right holder. It means the right holder is the person or also an entity uh, entitled to decide how can this work be used by third parties, by anyone in the world. And only the right holder is uh, entitled to decide. It is possible that the author transferred the rights to the right holder, this is the case very often uh, in the, um, when the, uh, 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 an author creates a work for the employer during the job functions um, based on the contract, based on the employment contract, the author transfers all the um, copyright to the employer or to the institution, not the person, but to the entity. In that case, the employer or the institution can be the, the, the university, can be a foundation, can be any kind of institution and authority, is the right holder. And that means that this entity, the right holder, is entitled to decide who can do what with the work. And if someone uh, is willing to use the work, the person is required to, must ask uh, permission to the right holder to be able to use the work for any purpose. Without permission, um, the person is not allowed to use the work. There are, uh, there are certain exceptions uh, set by the law. Again, the Berne Convention mm, foresees certain principles or wishes count, or there are also in Europe, there are uh, European directives uh, which require countries to develop uh, national laws that specific explicitly um, set certain rules. So we have exceptions allowing anyone to use a work without needing to ask permission. But again, that can be different from country to country. Mm -hmm. So for example, all, all countries of the world have an exception uh, permission to use a work for private use without needing to ask for permission. If I use, if I download a content for my personal use, I don't need to ask permission every time mm -hmm. I'm using the work for my private use. Yeah. But then, um, again, also there is an exception used a lot worldwide is the right to quotation. But it's not a very wide, it's not an unlimited right to quotation. I'm allowed to use someone else's work to include in my work, in my, for example, in my thesis, in my research publication, I'm allowed to include a part of someone else's work uh, in order to demonstrate, to better explain, to do as a reference of mm -hmm. what I'm uh, explaining, of what I'm trying to create. But there are certain limits and these limits this right uh, to quotation is can be different from country to country. Again, the principle is is worldwide. The principle is the same all over the world, and this Berne Convention Convention um, foresees the same principle. But then the details, yeah. the limits, may be slightly different from country to country. Oh. Um, so. Sorry, I, I just wanted to clarify or to, to put an example from my experience, like yeah. when we want to cite a quote from a book, it, yeah. it, like the, what, what might differ on, from country to country is the actual number of words or that, that can be cited. The extent. Yeah. That can, yes, exactly. 
or when it's an so image, for example like could it exactly be just a piece of the image or the whole image and would you then put a watermark some sort to to Exactly, that's a very, very big controversy that is uh, going on right now because, like, for example, we all have this right to quotation, but then to what extent uh, in Switzerland it is accepted by the doctrine and also by the federal court that a full image can be used as a quotation. But if you, if we think of why is there the pro where is the problem, the problem is Again, as talked about privacy, here the same. There are several interests that uh, are into play and that can be sometimes in conflict one with the other. So on one side, uh, copyright is part of the um, intellectual property rights, which are included, they are, are guaranteed in the right to property guaranteed by all our constitutions and or all also international human rights acts. Uh, so the right of property gives a monopoly, gives a right of exclusivity to the right holder about the work. Only the right holder is entitled to decide who can use a work. Um, so, for example, if, for example, Getty Images, Keystone, they are right holders of their of the images they have, and they sell these images. So, if I use a full image, if I publish a full image, even if it is inside my publication, but still I'm going against the interest of who is selling this full image. Uh, so it's finding a solution, finding a fair, again, a fair balance between right to property of the right holder and my or the, the researcher interest in using the image, for example, or using any content. Uh, so it's freedom of expression, freedom of research, also the right uh, to, to inform and the right to be informed. There are many interests, many rights on one side that are in conflict with the right to uh, right of property. So in Switzerland, as uh, as said, the doctrine and the federal court in certain cases, not always, but in, again, depending on the circumstances of, this con of the concrete case, it is possible that a full image can be used as a, a full image can be used as quotation because it wouldn't, maybe in certain cases, it wouldn't make sense to only use a part of an image. How can I use only part of an image? Um, in other, that's not the same in other countries. I know in Italy, in Germany, they absolutely don't accept a full image to be quoted, to be published as a quotation, because they, because this right of right property of the right holder prevails over the uh, freedom of expression and the uh, freedom of research, etc. Mm -hmm. So for a text, it's much it's much easier because it's easier to only extract uh, only an excerpt of the text. Uh, so only what is only the part of the text which is needed to quote to demonstrate what I'm talking about, um, I'm allowed to use this mm -hmm. only this part of the text, and there still is an interest in buying the full text. Full text. Yeah. If we think of uh, of an image, that's that's difficult. So this fair balance nowadays goes more into the side of guaranteeing the right to property instead of guaranteeing freedom of expression, unfortunately. Mm. And then there's also like now that we are on a podcast, there's also um, the right to music where, again, like it probably differs um, from country to country, what length of a musical piece exactly, yes. you can use as an intro for yes. the podcast. Again, it's this fair balance between, on one side, um, music is part of freedom of expression. Mm. Uh, in Switzerland, we, our constitution, uh, we have two different articles. One is freedom of expression, a right to freedom of expression, and another one specifically about um, uh, freedom of arts. In other countries, freedom of arts goes into freedom of expression. Mm. And uh, um, so again, one, it is not possible to create new knowledge, new art, new something new, without 
being inspired by previous works. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. We always are inspired. We are all, everything what we create is based on a previous work. So it's really a very big problem if someone pretends a very short, not even a very short uh, part of a music can be, can be included into a new work. Mm. So it's a very big controversy. It's, it's very mm. difficult to respect all interests or rights. Okay. But um, with that, I don't want to say that law is, um, on the other side, it's always asking permission to use the work to the right holder yeah, is the solution. Nice in you think about it. I mean, it's for people to be in touch, like one created, one put actually effort and heart and soul into a piece of creative creation. Exactly. So even if the law says you're not allowed to use a work without permission, it doesn't mean that you are absolutely not in, uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. Get in touch, ask for permission to the right holder. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully the right holder or the collecting societies, because there are every country has collecting societies mm -hmm. who represent the interests of the authors and right holders. So let, then hopefully the right holder or the collecting society are willing to give, to, to grant permission. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, if you allow, I would like to draw the copyright um, discussion into something that's crucial in the publishing process for researchers. Thinking like when it comes to the transfer of the copyrights as we publish, yep. which has become, I think this originated um, as a necessity in the print era, which we've I would say left in not all research disciplines and like countries where research is conducted, but like publishing is very much digital these days. And then there's claims that there is no need for copyright transfer anymore. And still it happens exactly. because it's convenient for the publishers and they can then decide what, like how the data is being used and they can actually sell it back to us as researchers, which happens on a daily basis, which you might find morally questionable at least but um but then also not to demonize publishers um all of them and generally there's also reasons even in the digital era for copyright considerations on the publisher side so yeah could you could you help us out here so what are the yeah. kinds of conflict and why do well, we don't transfer copyright or do we even have to and what are the publishers interests if we think of the development of publishing um, in the last years, we traditionally think of a publishing contract as the agreement between the author and the publisher, where the publisher is committed in uh, editing and doing a lot of work in order to then uh, sell, oh, how cute, dog. in order to then sell the, um, for example, the book. Uh, there is really a lot of effort, a lot of work uh, by the publisher to until the end product that is then um, released, published, and sold. Uh, traditionally, this publishing agreement, publishing contract, it's written about how many copies uh, must be printed, where these uh, copies must be sold, etc. Nowadays, in this um, digitalized work world, the publisher, mm, I don't want to minimize the, the, the job of the publishers, but often it's about mm, granting a platform where the work can be published, but there is not this big effort anymore as, as it used to be. So that's why it's not anymore mm, needed to transfer all the e-copyrights because um, the yeah the publisher doesn't is not part of all this um, creating of all this process of creating the work that at the end will be sold. So in such case, it is really possible for the author uh, to retain um, copyrights and granting the publisher the right to publish and to distribute to share the. Um, the, the work through a license. So it's not about 
transferring rights through a, con a transferring contract. It's not about assigning copyright, but it's about licensing rights, granting um, the right to publish the work and the author remains the right holder. The publisher has the right to publish. And then it depends on the circumstances. It depends on still the effort. Maybe if the publisher, uh, apart from publishing the work, maybe there is also a certain amount of effort in uh, advertising or really an effort in publishing and in uh, sharing the work. Maybe the publisher can uh, pretend an exclusive license for a certain period of time. On the other side, if the pub, if it's only about really mere publishing the work on a platform and nothing else, um, of course, there is no need to transfer the rights, only uh, maybe even a non-exclusive license is enough. So the, uh, dealing or agreeing on what copyright, what is the um, the, the, of what are the, sorry, just to, um, the, the, on one side there is the author and the, on, the, on the other side there is the publisher and it's about agreeing what are the roles, what, what is the role of the publisher, what is required from him to do. And based on that, there are certain levels of copyrights that can be assigned or granted, etc. There are very, there, there, there are, different possibilities of granting the rights. It's not only about assigning or not assigning copyrights. So the, the researcher who is willing to publish must be aware of what are his their rights, what are the possibilities. There is one possibility on one side is assigning copyrights to the publisher. That means the researcher, the author, is not anymore entitled to decide what to do with the work, where to publish the work. Only the publisher is entitled to decide about that. On the other extent, on the other, on the opposite side, there is a mere uh, non-exclusive license which grants the publisher the right to publish, but then the author remains the right holder and is allowed to publish the work also in other places. Um, and the, the author, the researcher, is still entitled to decide what to do with the work. The publisher has no right to decide about the work, is only, has only the right to publish the work, and that's it, nothing else. And within these two extreme, these two opposite possibilities, there, are, um, uh, there is a wide, wide range of possibilities, and it's really up to the parties it's called contractual autonomy. Parties are free to decide what to agree. So the researcher, of course, the publisher needs to accept. Both parties need to sign and accept, agree um, the agreement. But both parties are free to decide what to uh, what to agree. And there are there are really almost almost unlimited possibilities, not only the two opposite. Uh -huh. But that's what most researchers are not even aware of, that whatever they exactly. are being presented as a contract by the publisher to, yeah. to be considered for publication because that's such a, there's so, such high pressure to publish and then in certain journals who are, yeah. many of which are- They're so powerful, yeah. So, but, but you're saying, and that's also one, many publishers are actually negotiable. So it's yep. totally in the hands of the researchers to revise a contract and to add exactly. a contract to their needs and preferences and then go back. Yeah. To it. yeah. But then if the, it is important also to understand that if the researcher wants to negotiate certain parts of the contract, uh, then also the publisher on the other side needs to accept mm -hmm. the changes. Okay, so it's not enough to, for example, the researcher receives the standard contract and already um, already ready to be signed, and the researcher by hand makes some certain uh, um, changes, signs and sends the changed contract back to the publisher and pretends that the publisher accepts these changes. No, it's it's not always the case. It's better 
it's it's better to 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 write a formal letter to the publisher asking for the specific changes and receive the signature from the publisher that the publisher accepts these changes mm -hmm. so, so that's it's, it's really about a mutual agreement any change has to be mutually agreed yeah maybe two things to add obviously this also depends on the on the on the way ability of the publishers to actually want wanting to negotiate now if they if they don't want there is not much space for the for the researchers there but at least we can give a try first of all and maybe a second issue might be beyond maybe not being aware of of that we can negotiate is also um, knowing how to negotiate and then really the time investment to also deal with this aspect so if you think about how do we publish now it's always a rush towards the end and then we have to finalize and we submit uh, at the very end and okay usually um, uh, the, these contracts are signed after first uh, submission uh, but still then we have to do changes again and so we the focus is actually on the content and um, dealing also with the way of how something is then going to be published and this needs i think from the side of the research quite a lot of effort and sometimes it's just like okay i mean we just i'm interested in publishing no i need a publication and at mm. a certain point i just say okay whatever no yeah. and, uh, so it's the whole this whole way of publishing that might have no yeah needed need, it, need to change no also to yeah to find its space in the digital era and bringing some of the regulations and policies that are still in place to mm -hmm. modern standards um so and at, at the essence it's really a trading agreement between the researcher and the publisher in what terms they agree to trade under um where everybody has a stake and also the power to negotiate and and then it's on both parties to either come to agreement or not. Simple as that. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, researchers must be um, conscious of what are their rights, um, but also able to negotiate with publishers, taking their time to do that, etc. <clears throat> and then fair principles are about um, suggesting okay there is a goal of open access there is a goal of open science releasing research contents um, under an open license worldwide but concretely what does that mean so fair principles uh, help con concretely to um to share to release data that are concretely open not only for example if i uh, if I release uh, my my work under an open license, but it is technically not possible to open it uh, with um, free software, then it's it is legally open content, but it's concretely not open because it's it can only be opened with a the same um, the same software which is under payment, etc. So it's it's not uh, an open content. So yeah, on one level, there are copyright rules. And then next step, OK, now that I, I know I am aware of copyright rules, how do I concrete apply this, um, these principles to, for, my, for, for my work to be open? Um, then the fair principles, so it has to be uh, accessible also technically, not only through an open license, but also mm -hmm. technically. Uh, also, for example, if we think, we, we never think of a language, but if I want to release my content uh, openly, but I release it in, in, an, in a language which is understandable only by a very small part of the world, mm -hmm. then it's not really open. I mean, someone can is allowed to translate it because I permit any mm -hmm. modification of the work but itself, it's not an open content because mm -hmm. it's only understandable by who knows the language. Yeah. So it's all these concrete um, 
points of view must be considered mm. when in, in open science, so to say, not yeah. only legal issues. And then when it comes to fair, it's also mm. not only about mm. human languages, but also machine readability. So computer exactly. language yes. is also important yeah. to, to make it searchable by the indexing databases that we all now exactly. need to find the data that's been published. Yeah. Um, I would like to like now take the publishers or put on the publisher's shoes. What are negotiables and non-negotiables from a publisher perspective? What do they need in legal holding of our research manuscript and data to be actually still be able to process for publishing? You should ask a publisher. <laughs> so, okay. well, again, basically, first of all, publisher needs to have access, needs to need to receive the work in order to be able to publish it. That's the, 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 the main requirement. But then it depends on the circumstances, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It depends on the agreement. It depends on what is the role of the publisher in that specific case. Mm -hmm. um, because like, there are certain... to add to this, I mean, um, like you said before, it was the publisher's duty to form it, to, to yes, exactly. run the layout, they, they, they still do the layout to some extent, but the formatting ha has been pushed by the publishers towards the researchers. So now researchers find themselves and not only having to do the research, but also preparing the manuscripts, yes, writing the text, but also formatting the yep. text so that the publisher has as little work as possible with that. Yep, yep. But we're still paying for like, you know, whatever amounts in article processing charges. And you might ask, so what does, what justifies certain amounts that we pay and expect it to pay? But that's well, like another discussion that's price pricing. And that's another discussion to have. And it's not so much legally. Binding. Exactly. But, so it depends um, on the, the role, the effort of the publisher in certain cases, of course. If the publisher is the one entitled to uh, to format, to edit, <clears throat> to do the layout, uh, it's one thing. If on the other side the publisher only mm, gives the possibility uh, to, to to publish the work on a platform, so it grants it guarantees a certain visibility, but nothing else, no editing, then the law doesn't um, doesn't set a specific amount of rights that must be transferred to the publisher. It's really uh, free for the parties to negotiate, to agree, depending on the circumstances, depending on one side, recognizing what is the role of the publisher, but nothing is uh, must be granted to the publisher apart from, of course, sending the work itself so that the publisher can either edit it and publish it or only publish it. But you could also, like researchers could also design their own contracts and say, think. here's yeah. our work, here's our text, here's our data. Um, we already license it uh, with CC BY, attribution only. Um, and we now hand over to you. We might also pay a fee for you to publish this on our behalf online in your journal. Yep. And keep all the um, keep all the copyright and all the legal data um, aspects to the research yep. in the researcher's end. Yeah, so in that case, uh, the publisher only publishes the work, nothing else. In that case, it's uh, a license, of course, if the publisher agrees, but it would be enough to only enter in an into an agreement um as a, a, a license to publish the work and that's it so the pub you, you researchers remain right holders the publisher only has a right to publish the work then it depends uh either can be an exclusive license or non-exclusive it means either the publisher is the only one who has the right to publish you are not you are, mm -hmm. uh, authors mm -hmm. right holders are not allowed to publish the work elsewhere mm -hmm. Or if it's a non-exclusive license, then you are also allowed to publish the work uh, anywhere else. Um, yeah. It's possible to agree that with the publisher, the publisher, of course, must accept. 
Yeah, at this point, it's probably also good for um, to refer to the Sherpa Romeo database, which yep. um, specifies most well most publishers in the Western um, ecosystem um, are listed here, also non-Western journals to some extent. Where um, and we will also put that link into the um, show notes and the blog post. Mm -hmm. Where, where you can search by publisher what their legal requirements are, how they handle copyright, at what stage mm -hmm. of the processing of your manuscript. Um, so meaning preprint or the handed in manuscript, the author's version, the formatted version, the peer reviewed version, the layouted version, version of records, and then the published version. So each are steps that the publisher, where the publisher basically holds the not ownership, but holds the manuscript in their hands and process them where they add value to the manuscript. And therefore then, is it that then they actually get copyright to the work because they're processing it with our agreement? It depends. Um, it depends on the agreement the publisher has with the author. It's not something automatically. There is no rule uh, such as if your effort is more than a certain percent of the work, then automatically you become the right holder. No, it depends on a case by case oh, basis. Okay. And maybe if the publisher has a certain amount of um, of work in creating the, the entire work, it is possible that the publisher is joint author, so co-author with the writers. Mm. So it depends on the, 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 the case. Um, our Swiss law, there is one article that says it can be the case when the publisher decides about, for example, the, about the topic of the, um, the work, about the book, the publisher invites or um, asks specific writers to give their contribution into the work. Each contributor writes, for example, one chapter, and then the publisher again himself uh, he gives the structure to the book uh, decides what chapter goes one after the other and the publisher re, um, decides what what are the topics that must be uh, written about so in that case the the writers they are they don't have a lot of uh, room to decide about the work they only so to say they only um, write the text, but they follow the instructions given by the publisher. In such case, of course, the publisher is the right holder, but uh, it can be certain cases, again, depending on the work behind. Um, it can be joint author with writers. If the writers only really execute the instructions of the publisher, it's possible that the publisher is a right holder and writers are not even authors. So it depends really on this. There is a wide range of possibilities depending on how much uh, each one had a role in, the, in creating the work. So, but this is an extreme uh, case where the publisher is the one who, so to say, directs the, the whole work decides what must be written, how to structure the book, um, the chapters, who will be the uh, writer, the, the, the publisher uh, decides uh, who are the contributors, et cetera, et cetera. If it's not that extreme case, in all other cases, it depends on the role of the publisher and authors are allowed to negotiate because the publisher, if it's only about really a mere publishing of the work, then no need to transfer the copyrights. Thank you. Um, I would like to maybe conclude on the copyright chapter before we come to look into the Dium Law tool that you developed. Yep. Um, again, with the care principle. So, and also I would like just to mention that we will take this up in future episodes of this show um, because also again, like it is, a, it is a, a topic that's due to my heart, like to consider ethical and moral aspects and ownership aspects of copyright in yeah. a research context. And 
again, this was also developed by indigenous representatives who saw potential infringement of their knowledge um, by research practices and the insufficiency of our understanding of the copyright to always be tied to one individual person, where in indigenous and I think all of other world like societies, there, well, in indigenous communities in particular, there's not such thing as individual ownership um, when it comes to, especially to traditional knowledge, it's always a collective ownership of the, of the community. But we don't have a legal system to, in the research context, that is to justify that and to ensure um, that, that knowledge is protected towards like what we would do under the copyright for the whole community. And therefore they added these care principles like collective benefit, authority and control, um, responsibility, like who is responsible mm -hmm. for the curation management mm -hmm. of the data and ethical aspects in all directions. Um, is there like, I mean, again, so when it came to data protection, also the legal system that we that we established for Western societies is very much morally driven, isn't it? So it's it's it tried or established structures to rely on to protect individual interests, to protect societal interests, to to ensure that we don't harm each other. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so it is actually comparable. It's just that it has limitations because it's based on a capitalist or um, modern society, whatever that means, um, concept. Yeah, you need to consider law uh, apply must apply to all cases. So, it's law must be abstract and general in order to be able to apply to all cases. So it's really sometimes it seems like law is very far away from a concrete case uh, or from certain circumstances from a certain a specific um, context so agreements nowadays we use more and more agreements which are uh, more quickly to create because uh, law requires a lot of time to be changed a lot of time to be in line with the development of the society. Whereas these conventions uh, or agreements or, as, or these principles, they are more, they're closer to a concrete case, to a, certain, a specific um, context. So we try to create this, either we can call them like agreements or principles or conventions, it, they, have, so they can have several names, mm -hmm. but the goal of, the aim of these, um, of these acts, or of these, um, how to say, principles, mm -hmm. is to find a solution that is understandable, that is accepted worldwide, or that is accepted from a whole society, and that is applied by a whole society, yeah. where the law, has difficulties in uh, being in line with that specific um, context. So it's basically trying to put a general concept, which is, which which covers any potential case without being specific. But the, the policies exactly. and and agreements are those specifics to regulate what's not the more yes action. So we have, as said, so there is on one side copyright law, which is imperative which um, there is no space to negotiate mm. like we, we cannot negotiate what is protected by copyright or not we cannot mm. negotiate who is the right holder or not but there is room to negotiate in the agreement between the right holder and any user and the law really gives freedom to the parties to negotiate to the gives this contractual autonomy because it's the law says, okay, the law, myself as a law, I set certain rules, sort of general abstract rules, and then it's up to you to agree in your private interests. Um, so within this freedom in agreements, of course, there is always like publishers are 
powerful, they have more power than researcher, than one only single user. So in uh, creating such principles, conventions or agreements, we try to help, we try to give more power to one only user, which is not one only user. One only user is part of one whole community who is willing to use a work. So uh, these principles are like created to give more power to one whole community that is uh, entering into an agreement with a publisher who is an entity and who is powerful, okay? So it's these several levels and yeah, as said, and as you, you said, these principles uh, try to find a solution, try to set certain rules where the law is just too high, too, too abstract, too general to be, I, I wouldn't say that it's not useful, but it's, it cannot cover all specific ex aspects. Yeah. And therefore also, like we said in the previous episode, I cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. okay now, yes. Okay. It leaves a lot of room for interpretation on yeah. the execution level, basically. And, yeah. But it puts a framework, which this is how we agreed as a society to like under these rules we want to operate but then when it becomes specific we we still have room for negotiating and exactly yes identify what are the benefits what and the law the wants to give this room to negotiate mm -hmm. uh, so based on the concrete circumstances of the case mm -hmm. so and then but then we, we need these principles to, yeah to help yeah and it's funny that Things like the FAIR principles only emerged was in 2016, they were postulated to regulate research data discoverability and reusability, yep. which also again is very much legally binding and um, you know, um, where many legal aspects come into play. Um, I mean, there, yeah, there, we're, we kind of were away and operated in a certain way, maybe more on a national level, but now where everything is being kind of internationalized, globalized, Digitized. Yeah, there are no, there are no borders anymore. Mm -hmm. And we need mm -hmm. these international licenses, for example, Creative Commons licenses, which are worldwide, or FAIR principles, CARE principles, they are accepted by this whole community that goes beyond one only nation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, like for, for your listeners, you didn't hear much of that, but sometimes I apologize. We have a whining, impatient doggy here. In, in the Who's also participating in this conversation. <laughs> having a say. Um, but yeah, so the digital, no, the, the DM law, yeah. let's, let's get to how can we now simplify what, what almost took two hours to pass through what the reasoning behind why we have data protection and copyright, what are the use cases in research, what are the use cases outside the research environment, um, what's, the re what's the reasoning behind, and how can we now make it simple for the researchers to adopt, and this is where you thankfully developed the tool for, so over to you Anna. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So you, you have seen there is actually quite a lot of complexity to, to deal with. So that's, that's the reason why we actually developed this DM law tool, because it aims at guiding the researchers through the most relevant legal aspects uh, related to research data management. And then at the end proposes possible solution approaches, both to copyright and data protection issues. So uh, maybe a few words on how it has been created. It has been developed uh, by the Università della Svizzera Italiana in collaboration with the University of Neuchâtel uh, within the P5 program of scientific information of Swiss universities. So this is the, the background. It has been, uh, I, if I remember, remember well, a one year project. Um, so how did we try to, to, to deal with this complexity? We um, we actually try to organize all information in the form of a decision tree within which each node provides the necessary uh, definition and explanations in order to actually decide uh, which branch to take next. 
Um, so to see now, I don't know, probably you don't see the DM law tool in front of you, but so you can click on each node and it will uh, open a, a window with all the definitions and explanations. Um, you also see that we have divided their different colors. So uh, we divided the topics. So all the, um, the fields that are related to copyright are in blue while the ones related to data protection are in green. So now if you, um, like the, the tree utilities, they also allow you to completely expand the tree. And you see that actually the part on data protection is much smaller than the one on copyright because uh, copyright actually involves much, much more rules, uh, more complexity to deal with uh, again. Um, yeah, what else to say? You can zoom in, you can zoom out the tool. You, there is a, a search box, so you can search any kind of keyword. And we also provided tags uh, that allow you to guide through uh, some topics and maybe a little bit more easy. Uh, I was talking about colors. Sorry, I forgot to mention the, the yellow one. So the, all the end nodes, those nodes actually proposing the solutions, once you went through a whole pass, they are uh, highlighted in yellow. And uh, yeah, as I said, should propose some, some, some solutions. Um, yeah, I think this is the, the most important part. I think it's a tool that you have to go in, you have to play a little bit with it, and you have to explore it uh, in order to see uh, whether it's useful to you and how. Uh, it can apply, but it should really, thanks to this decision tree, it really um, allows you to answer one question and then based on whether it's yes or no, you go in one direction, you answer a next question and slowly you get to the final solution with some um, approaches and proposals on how you can base once you reach to the end of, of a specific uh, branch. So I, I would say in, in a few words, this is what the DM law tool is actually about. So here we are talking about uh, research data mainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And also like we mentioned in the previous episode, and as might have also become clear from the conversation is that as much as we had a lot to talk about when it came to data protection, but the underlying regulations are quite simple so to say, also as your tree shows. Whereas for copyright, there's uh, quite a, a higher level of complexity in the tree, tree structure as well. Um, but I agree with you, it's, it's really to dig in this, there's a cons coherent and concisive amount of text. Um, so there's examples and use cases, um, explanations like, a glossary, like where terms are being defined, what it means and um, and how it applies to research. Um, what are der derivative works, for example, is a bit of a cryptic term or scientific term or legal term rather. And what's the der derivative um, when it comes to a research item? Yeah, maybe one thing I, I didn't mention, when you actually open up uh, one box now, so with mm -hmm. the the explanations we try to structure this text always in the same in the same way so yeah. you you start with a, okay you are here because uh, you mm -hmm. have you have made some choices before no yeah. um, you have then the next section is the next step so you have different options to choose among mm -hmm. and then the the third section is about definitions needed to make your choice to mm -hmm. whether how to go to go next and then to, um, to conclude, we have an FAQ section and the be, be aware of or pay attention to section, which mm -hmm. uh, is not always uh, filled in yet, but uh, yeah. So the, the, the user is actually, uh, can get used to this structure. Now it's always uh, in the text is uh, structured always in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really useful. And it also speaks to the complexity and the amount of work that went into designing this. <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, yeah, this is another issue. I mean, now I also, when I look at it, I was like, okay, now it looks actually 
quite simple and yeah. straightforward. The, the decisions on uh, which kind of branches to choose is, is very mm -hmm. logic, but I can assure you there was a lot, huge amount of work behind that and a lot of discussions on how mm -hmm. to actually organize the, yeah. all the contents and uh, how to aggregate. And that, that was a lot of work. I, yeah, I can I can really only imagine like it's not my my expertise playing field, but um, getting more and more into it, and it is super helpful to have the tree tree structure, this expanding tree, so it keeps it. And maybe also the fact of it, it is the result of a collaboration between legal experts and non-legal experts. Mm -hmm. No, so um, also this continuously trying to find a compromise in the language of mm -hmm. it has to be accurate enough, but from, from our side, it then has to be also comprehensible enough. No? Yeah. So there was a continuous negotiation also from, from that point of view. Yeah, no, yeah, and that's, that's really the essence also for science communication. If we make a yeah. transfer of concept here yeah. um, to being able to explain complex systems with simple terms and concepts really so that everybody can benefit and i would like to con conclude on the two in our conversation with the human rights declaration article 27 um and there's two points to make i'm just reading it up for all of us so number one everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And then the second is everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he or she should have, or them should have, is the author, which basically summarizes nicely what, like the whole conversation that we had today is also enshrined in the human, human rights declaration. So of course, yeah. Um, and that then gives us the global applicability and ensures that as researchers, like we, we live and act in a globalized world, we publish in a globalized world. Um, people all, all around the world, not in every village necessarily, but in every country for sure, have access to the internet and therefore also have the rights to participate and to consume the knowledge that we generate, but also we, as the generators of the knowledge, have also a, a right to protect our knowledge and protect research subjects, people who participate in our research from yeah, disclosing their personal data from any potential misuse. So, so it has a global dimension. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if I can just add about our DM law tool, it is about Swiss law. But main principles are the same all over the world. Um, all copyright acts have the same, foresee the same principles as well as the Berne Convention. Um, so I would say, uh, if you look at the exceptions that we have explained in the DM law tool, these exceptions are really about Swiss law and are only applied in Switzerland or when someone uses a work in Switzerland. Uh, whereas, um, explanations about um, privacy, data protection, and about licenses, agreements, uh, creative commons licenses. These explanations um, can be applied all over the world because these agreements are about people that can also be in different countries. Um, one thing. The other thing I would like to add is um, we didn't talk about moral rights that are protected by copyright laws. We could have another podcast just about moral rights. So here, when we talk about agreements, because copyright is split, can be split in two groups, moral rights and economic rights. So moral rights are rights that rather protect the personality of the author. Economic rights are rights about how a work can be exploited, can be used. So. Creative Commons licenses, for example, but any kind of um, copyright license, any agreement w between the author or the right holder and a user, they are only about economic rights of copyright. In English, when we talk about copyright, we often refer to this group, economic rights, uh, so how a work can be used. 
because moral rights cannot be transferred. So it's not possible to regulate, it's not possible to negotiate moral rights. That's why they are not in, included into a licensing agreement. Yeah, that's just to, uh, just to end the, the, but because of this universal declaration of human um, rights uh, also mentioned moral rights, that's why, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I would really love to dig into these aspects that you just um, so hopefully we will be able to reconvene to to dig deeper on this, the differentiation of both because I think it's highly relevant to researchers and the research ecosystem yeah. as a whole. Um, because I get a feeling and I didn't want to carry that level of responsibility as a graduate student, but I get a feeling we have to embrace responsibility um, when it comes to our research data also to assume any potential user misuse of what we publish because also we are considered the elite of society if we like it or not i mean to talk about kind of whatever elite means but um we 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 have on a gamma level of education and an engagement and um yeah learning and, and engaging in research in the unknown also. So can we not expect ourselves also and be expected by other societal stakeholders to, to be aware of that responsibility to consider any potential misuse? Of course, you can only foresee so much as what we can actually anticipate. Yeah. But shouldn't that also be a clear, like on the radar of any researcher in a research process um, to, to consider these potential outcomes like why are we doing this and what is the potential outcome of our activities so for a researcher the first step the most important thing is to be aware of what are the rights meaning uh, that's, that's, what are the economic rights um, so how a researcher is allowed is able to negotiate with the publisher so that's about economic rights of copyright mm -hmm. if you want to get to go forward and go to more conceptual level more abstract then we can also include moral rights yeah in the interest of time let's push us for another meeting <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you both so much and um yeah thank you space if you want thanks to you including remarks anything else to add any like what's the next step with the tool now is it still being is it considered complete now or how quickly do some of these aspects and um, legal requirements change over time so that you need to monitor and, and keep adapting? I mean, there are certain aspects that still actually need to be completed. And so on a, when we have time, we sometimes go in at some examples, some, some sections that can be maybe a little bit more detailed out. Um, with regards to the content, obviously we always have to check whether ch law is changing. So next year, um, the new data protection law uh, will enter in uh, uh, in force in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be some small aspects that have mm -hmm. to be reconsidered. So we will, but we are checking this. We keep this. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to keep it up to date uh, as good as possible. <laughs> And it is quite quite co coherent already. So really, like as we also said, just to um, encourage everyone who hears this to click on the link in the show notes in the blog post. Um, just play with the tool, familiarize yourself with legal considerations and licenses and use cases, and be aware that the tool is designed or built up on a Swiss legal framework which applies to a large extent also in other countries, but not necessarily in yours to 100%. So um, add the component of your national requirements to the equation. And also the national requirements of the, the research, sorry, <laughs> the region where your research is taking place that might also be um, something to consider. So if you have collaborators in other countries then their legal system applies. Um, or maybe also where the work's been published, like the, the I don't know. So this, these are questions we haven't really answered, but maybe can also consider next time. Or 
yeah but otherwise it was a lot of information i have learned a lot thank you again mm -hmm. and speak to you soon yeah thank you very much for inviting us and having us with you and uh, i think you're doing a great job with uh, uh, divulgating this such kind of very useful information for for everybody thank so. you yeah Bye thank much. you joe and keep in touch yes <laughs> Um, ciao. Thank you very much. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Bye bye.